Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the least listened to podcast on the globe. The Sixth Sense Media Podcast with your host, Mike Phelan. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I woke you up. <laughs> what, what, where the heck have you been, man? I've been waiting here. <laughs> It's all right. It, it happens. Michael, I, I looked at your shows. You, I thought you were a professional. <laughs> well, as you can tell by this room, I'm very professional. Uh, it looks like my room, too. <laughs> hey, baby, it was totally my fault, and I do apologize. How are you? I, I am all right. How about yourself? I'm, I'm fine. I'm rested. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Perfect. That's that's exactly what I want my uh, guests to be, is well-rested, not fall asleep. I, I, that's the first thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what can I do for you, uh, my fine I, sir? I'd like to know, I'd like to start with, uh, how did you get involved in the industry? None of your business. Okay. Next, qu next question. <laughs> Why do you want to be in this industry? <laughs> Why, indeed. Uh, I started out as a very small person as uh, many of us do. Uh, I mean, in terms of my interest, I, I wanted to do it ever since I was a little kid. I was always, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing voices. Uh, well, first of all, I would hear voices and then I would try to do them. Now, seriously, I, I, uh, I just had that, uh, we all have it, you know, that knack or that impulse, uh, the natural ability to ape things. That's what, uh, one of the things humans can do. We also can chew our own ice cubes, you know. So we have certain skills, and one of them is to imitate each other. And I did that uh, from the get-go. And uh, so I thought, gee, that'd be a good fit if I did something with my voice. Also, my father was a radio guy. He uh, went to uh, Tulsa University on the GI Bill. And uh, I used to you know, go to him uh, w with him when he would go to his radio classes or uh, uh, just go and be on the air. He was an on the air guy. So I, I fell in love with that whole thing. Look at those microphones and the wires and the knobs and you know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah. So uh, that's what started me on my way. And the first uh, street into that was uh, broadcasting. And so I became a broadcaster and uh, did that for years. I would you know, DJ on the air. And uh, part, of my, uh, part of my package was that, uh, oh, you're the guy that does voices and uh, so on and so forth. I didn't really get a chance to be a, a voice for any kind of animation until I was uh, oh, probably well into my 30s and, um, or early 30s, I guess. And I was in San Francisco doing a, a show at KSFO. And I, I don't know what, I, I think I just started sending out tapes and I got a nibble from an agent, uh, uh, Bob Colvin, Kerry Phelps and Colvin, they're no longer around, but they were a great agency, signed me and uh, brought me down for an audition. And I went home and I got the audition. It was for Marvel for the part of uh, one of the parts in uh, transformer and I had to get back on a plane and fly back down and I did it and I realized I couldn't really pursue this if I continued to live in San Francisco so after some years of uh, of you know a lot of uh, uh, hard thinking and weighing things I decided that I would leave broadcasting and come down to uh, Los Angeles. It was very scary, but I had a great uh, lady as a wife and she, uh, she supported that. And uh, so we pulled up stakes and moved to Los Angeles. And the rest I think is animation history. Was, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, oh no, it isn't either. <laughs> <laughs> I made that mistake in my head, it's animation history. Was it a big culture shock moving from San Francisco to L.A.? Um, the only culture shock, uh, Mike, was the fact that I didn't have a steady job. Mm -hmm. And I was brought up back in from Pittsburgh, PA, and having a steady job back there was always kind of like the number one issue for any, uh, any person, any family. Um, 
employment being very difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. Is my point um, in in Pittsburgh of, of those days, uh, and so that bothered me, and kind of it really actually freaked me out. But uh, the gods were on my side, and I started getting work. I got on camera work. Um, I was a young guy with uh, uh, just a kind of an every man's look, and so I did a lot of commercials as the husband or the father. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got too old for that, I moved, moved on to other categories. But in the meantime, I was starting to build up a, a kind of a, a track record for animation. And I started working at Hanna-Barbera Hanna regularly under Alex Lovey. Any voice guys listening from that era know who Alex Lovey was. He was head of animation. And uh, Gordon Hunt, a great director there at Hanna-Barbera. And then uh, one day, I'll tell this story quickly, but this is uh, sort of what, what happened, what got me into a launch pad. I went over to Bob Lloyd's voice caster uh, and uh, that was in Burbank. I lived out in West LA, so it was a long drive. And I just, just had this little tiny uh, thing to say in the audition, like try them, you'll like them or something like that. And I was kind of irritated. You know, I drove, I don't know, what is that, 25 miles in heavy traffic to say, utter these three or four words. And hello, what's this? I see a stack of auditions off in the corner. And it said something like, for appointments only, or, or it, was, it was only for people who had been scheduled to come here and do this. Mm -hmm. And so that said, hmm, that looks rather important. And I have, have apparently developed a skill that I think all voice people, all actors develop, and that is being able to read uh, material in a casting director's office upside down. And I looked over there and I said, this is Disney. This is a Disney project. Long story short, finally, I get the, I, I just grabbed the page and it was the page for Launchpad. And it said, must be able to do, or no, the reference was, because they'll give you references, a sound-alike reference. And it was a cross between John Ratzenberger and Jack Burns. John Ratzenberger from Cheers, the mailman, and Jack Burns, who had been one season uh, replacement of uh, Don Knotts in Mayberry. He, had, he, had a, um, he, he talked like this. So uh, you've seen it, huh? Huh? Yeah? Huh? And so I knew who he was. And uh, when it came time for the audition, I nailed it. But I had to call my agent and say, I'm over here at VoiceCaster. Can you get me in on this thing? I mean, he said, well, Terry, you know, it's by appointment special. I said, if you don't do it, I'll, I'll, I'll hold my breath. <laughs> you know, like a kid. <laughs> and he said, all right, all right, all right. Calm down. I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do. And he called Bob Lloyd and Bob said, okay. And, and uh, that's what happened. And the producer, whoever was in there, I can't, his name was Tom something, can't remember it. But he said, bingo, that's it. You're the guy. And we sat there and talked for uh, several minutes about Launchpad, uh, the creative stuff, you know, literally how they're gonna bring him to life because the voice is only part of it. And uh, they were just designing him and figuring that he would be the comic foil, the goofus, uh, who uh, was always screwing things up, but was loved and, and you know, ha had some charm to him. And uh, not only did that all come to pass, but he became so uh, successful that they decided to spin him off into Darkwing Duck. And that was kind of a first. I don't know of any animated character. <laughs> that got the, got the spinoff, but uh, so I, I got those two series and um, I, I'm, that was probably in now 30 years later, I look back and that was probably the most important work I did during my 15 years in LA uh, because I'm still enjoying the success of it. And that's the story. It's, it's definitely something I remember because I grew up in the eighties and remembering your very distinct voice in that mm -hmm. role. And um, now, now that I'm a writer and now that I, I do this, I, I, I look back and I'm like, who are some of those people that really 
got me into the industry to, to be interested in voice acting and and the whole process of making entertainment. And I was like, you know what? I should I should see if if uh, Terry McGovern is uh, is available to talk. <laughs> It's like, I'm so I do. glad you did, and I'm so glad somebody woke me up. <laughs> I feel like the guy that came out of the crypt, you know. <sighs> How, it's very embarrassing. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sorry. Oh, it, it's. I've, I've had worse. I've been, I've been yelled at by people that were late to their own interviews. <laughs> oh no, no, no. That's not my. That's not my bit. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very responsible, if sleepy person. I, I'm at my girlfriend's house. At, and when you when you go to visit somebody, at, you know anybody, your the, the clock gets really thrown off uh, mm -hmm. from, from traveling, and that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. But you've done some great interviews. I looked at your work, and I'm I'm oh, very honored. You. I'm honored to be here. What else might I help you with? Uh, the process for I'm I'm not a I'm not an actor. I I tried my stint in L.A. It did not work for me. I'm just not that kind of guy that can break apart from myself. I see myself in everything I do. So I can't read a line and not be me. I just, I don't have the talent for it. But the, there's two, there's a distinct line between acting on film and voice acting. But what is the best way that you can describe that process? Where is that break from voice actor to uh, screen actor? Well, they can't see it. Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> That's number one. But you're still acting. <laughs> you're still acting. You're in there. You're acting. Um, you, you know, I, I teach acting. I, I have a, a, a class. Well, we're not in session now because of uh, the pandemic. I'm, I'm really trying to figure out what the heck to do because some of my act, uh, teachers, what am I saying? Some of my clients, my actors, are chomping at the bit to get by, back. And I... Uh, haven't uh, pulled the trigger on doing that. We're thinking maybe after the first of the year. But in any event, the Marin Actors Workshop, and I tell them, well, I tell them many things to help them uh, in their pursuit of acting. And one of them is that the distinction is, it, I think it's, it's thin, not only thin, I think it doesn't exist. I think we act and that's it. We perform and that's it the technique or the the technical aspect of it the fact that you're not seen it's not visual acting the only thing that uh, uh tells me and i tell my students is that you have to amplify it you do the same thing only you kind of kind of blow it up and uh hold on a sec i gotta get rid of that call you did i damage things no nope, you're good oh, okay uh, it, it, it's a matter of amplification. If you're doing a, the voice for a character um, that's being drawn, then you're the person, with all due respect to the animator, you're the person that gives it legs. You're the person that breathes, uh, breathes life into the character. Uh, because, you know, if you watch animation and turn the sound off, most animation, it may still look pretty good, but it, it, it dies. It doesn't have life. Mm -hmm. And boom, once, once the sound is added, and that includes music, sound effects. But most important is, is how the actor imbues uh, the, the, the character, this animated character, with life. And that's done through tremendous energy and projection. So, yeah, there's a line between the two. But I think it's very, very thin. The only thing is it, it's bigger. So mm -hmm. it's a real simple direction. Make it bigger. Come on, make it bigger. <laughs> uh, when you would go into auditions for voice roles, uh, how did you how did you approach each audition? How did you get yourself into that headspace to uh, perform? Well, auditioning is really what we do as actors. I mean, at least for me in L.A., I had clothes in my car so that I could go out at the beginning of the day. L.A. is so vast. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, you can't be running home every time you get an audition and find something to wear. And in those days, all I can say was because it was a very good economy and because I had this sort of uh, every guy doofus kind of look you know, without the beard, uh, I just got a lot of work. And, and that made auditioning to me very pleasurable. Uh, when I didn't get 
the job or when there was a lull in things, uh, I was not so happy. But I always, I, I think I developed a, a mechanism for auditioning that just said, go and get it. And I, I did. I, that was if, if I was going to audition, pardon me, little things on the screen. Um, if I was going to audition, then I was going to go get it. And if that sounds egotistical, well, it is. <laughs> and how in God's name could you possibly do this work without an ego, mm -hmm. without a belief that you're the guy for the job? Otherwise, uh, you just go in there and sit in a room full of, uh, you know, guys like you and you, you talk to each other and go have a beer maybe together afterwards. But not me. I, I was too competitive. I was snarly. I, I you know, uh, I, was, I, I mean, I wasn't unpleasant to people, but my, my mm -hmm. mindset was very aggressive and very, uh, uh, very competitive. And I, th I think that generate, that's part of how you get work. The people inside the room see that this guy has, uh, is serious about doing this. And you know, that's, if you think about it, auditioning from the auditioner's point of view, what are they looking for? They're looking for somebody who can do what? Hello, solve their problem. They have a problem. And so they go out and look for an actor to solve it. That is, you get that concept? I think it's, I think it's pretty basic. So you have to appear not only as maybe the guy with the right voice or maybe the right look, there has to be what, that one extra thing that pushes you over the top and makes them say, well, he's, he's not gonna be a problem. <laughs> he's gonna do his job. At, he's, not gonna, he's not gonna take a nap and sleep in or he's gonna, you know what I mean? He's going to he's going to uh, pay attention to what has to be done mm -hmm. and help and help us succeed. You have to be a, a part of a team and seen that way. And you're pretty much always selling yourself for oh. every. It, it's like it's always a job. You always have to you're the package and you always have to be the prettiest package. Oh, yes, <laughs> you're right. it, it, I never thought in a metaphorical of it that way, sense. <laughs> I think you're right. Hmm. I couldn't do you it because they be... always they're always like, we want a heavy. You could be a good heavy. It's like I, I don't want to always play a heavy. I don't want to be just the guy in the background just being the bouncer. That's why I was kind of like, it, this just isn't for me. Because if my best role is a non-speaking role in the background, just as scenery, then I'm not being an actor, I'm just being a prop. Well, you know, there's, I, I agree with you up to a point, but I also think there's, I know a lot of people who started out as extras, as mm -hmm. atmosphere. And what could be worse than being called an extra? An extra what? Something that has to be removed? What does extra mean? Uh, or, or atmosphere is another term for us, mm -hmm. if we're in the background. But it's all your point of view. If, if, you're, if, if you feel the way you do, Michael, that, that it's a waste of your time and your, your presence. But there are things that happen sometimes on a set. Uh, 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 a director might say, I need another person here in the foreground. Mm -hmm. This happens all the time. And so the AD, the assistant director, looks out, looks around. And maybe if you're the guy that has been in his face a little bit in a nice way, mm -hmm. that you're the guy uh, or, or, or the gal, you know, who, uh, who, who pops out a little bit in this group, then you're gonna get the finger crook. Come here for a mm -hmm. second. Hey, uh, the director needs somebody in the foreground. Uh, do you know how to speak? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do, I do, yes, I speak. Well, you're gonna say, uh-oh, look out. And so you step now up close to the camera in frame and say, uh-oh, look out and you have won, you have achieved the fact that you're now, your extra card, a uh, guild card, now says acting because you've, you've gotten a bump. And now uh, you, you can say to your union, I have uh, done that job that mm -hmm. uh, entitles me to be called an actor and you get your SAG card. And you go home and you kiss your wife and say, let's celebrate. So, I mean, that happens, that happens to extras. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a lot of them do the work. 
uh, in the hopes that they're going to get a bump. And uh, some do. But what happened to you? You decided you didn't want to do it. And what did, what did you do? Uh, it's just, it wasn't for me. I'm, I'm from Florida. Um, I oh, was well, raised a very, I, it, a lot of us went to LA when uh, Dread Central moved from Florida to uh, California. And all of us that were with the site when it started, it just kind of grew apart. And I stayed exactly as I was, but I noticed my friends are becoming much more ambitious and a little bit more cutthroat and a little bit more ready to kind of kick you to the side if they saw an opportunity coming. I was like, it's, it just wasn't for me. I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And when I saw that I didn't have the talent as an actor, I just said, oh, I'm just going to go back to Florida, but I will still work in the industry writing and doing interviews and everything. I'll Good do it. You. I'll do it as an ancillary part of it, but still Good. very much a part of it. I mean, still get dragged before the pandemic would get dragged by Netflix and universal, like all over the country just oh, to cover something. So I'm, I'm still part of it, but I don't have to, I don't have to sacrifice a part of myself that I didn't want to give up. Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, I, I'm, it's just, that's it's, it's very commendable. And, and that's what we have to do. We have to kind of know what we want to do and we have to know it clearly at most important, we have to know it early in mm -hmm. our life. Uh, that wonderful book by Malcolm Gladwell, The Outliers, talks about uh, these people who at uh, in their teen years knew crystal clear exactly what they wanted to do. And they started to do it. Uh, in the case of the Beatles, you remember them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm a Beatles fan, yeah. <laughs> oh, can't wait, November, what, 17th? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jackson uh, re release, uh, releases those uh, those films. Yep, uh, from the uh, '69 session, the Let It Be session. Boy, I can't wait to see it. But those guys, uh, they knew what they wanted to do, and they were in Hamburg, Germany, in their early early twenties, doing God knows how many shows a day, mm -hmm. honing their craft, and getting to the point where I mean, the Beatles when they appeared on the scene, they were and it, a very, very, very good band. Or as we used to call back in, back in the uh, pre-Beatle days, if, if you were in a group, a musical group, it was called a combo. <laughs> but these guys were excellent musicians by dint of their hard work in Hamburg, their relentless playing. And so when the opportunity came, they were not just for they weren't the monkeys with all due respect to the monkeys because some of them had mus real musical talent yeah. mm -hmm. and, and to and together uh, their their producers created a phenomenon they they were wonderful the monkeys mm -hmm. but the band the the uh, the beatles were the real thing they lived the life walked the talk all that all those other cliches and i think that's essential you have to have an idea of what you want to do and don't wait for accidents mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I guess I'm, I'm taking the juice out of what I said about being an extra, but being an extra also has an intent, you know, uh, I'm going to do this because something's going to happen while I'm there. Mm -hmm. And you, you did that too. You, you're, you're there. You know what I mean? You put yourself in a place where you could do the work and be noticed and, and reap the rewards. And you have. Mm -hmm. I think the best way to look at it, if you're someone like that does what I do, is that you don't do it for the recognition. You do it because you love the entertainment industry. You love the art of making movies and making entertainment. And you just you just want to cover it. Because if I didn't like it, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> if I didn't like the film industry, then I would just, this would just be another job and I would just yeah. burn, burn out. Yeah. And, and so that's it. But you do it. You do mm -hmm. it all the time. And you get better and better and better at it. Uh, honing the skill, whatever the skill is, is the most important thing. Uh, and, and it creates, I don't want to sound you know, metaphysical here, <laughs> but in the act of doing the work also creates opportunities. I don't know how that happens, but if you're working at being something, an opportunity will present itself mm -hmm. eventually. 
it may be the right one it may not be but but keep at it because you'll you'll make something happen mm -hmm. it takes it's there is that lucky break that happens or that lucky coincidence or that connection just mm -hmm. that that little bit of networking that can take you from writing reviews on some website that no longer exists to all of a sudden you're getting calls from studios saying hey would you like to come out and see this production we'll fly you out like oh i went from no one caring what i did to all of a sudden studios actually requesting you by name to come out and it was just it was just that little bit of trying and then just that one connection just suddenly just blossoms and, and, into this thing and don't that feel good <laughs> i mm -hmm. it does it does give feel you, really good don't it <laughs> It does give you a bit of a big head, though. I mean, sometimes I catch myself being a little bit of a snob about it, which is. You do have a rather large coconut. What is that? About a seven and a three quarter? <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to take my hat off because I'm bald. So <laughs> there's too much glare from the. <laughs> let's, let's, let's do it. I dare you. One, two, three. <laughs> there we are. There's there. my boy. <laughs> You could be my boy. Look at you. I started losing it at 25. And then by 30, it was just all gone. <laughs> I have some up there. It's just a little wispy stuff. <laughs> I'm always shocked when I see myself on camera. Who's the bald guy? Oh, it's me. What the heck? I think we look pretty good, man. <laughs> you had and more, you had more hair the age you were in Mrs. Doubtfire than I had at that same age. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I did. I did have a little bit up there. Yeah, I, but, had, um, I had none. It was it was just all gone. And I I looked like I was in my 40s when I was 27. <laughs> yeah, I and that that, that kind of an effect. I would did it, did it I depress you a lot. I mean, were you really concerned about it? It it bothered me for a little bit because um, my dad has a full head of curly hair. And, and he's in his uh, he's in his 80s and that's my my, my cousin and my uncle all have this baldness <laughs> but somehow i i got that hereditary part of it so yeah I, when it started to go because i was still i was still young and fit but i was looking older than i should be and then one day i just shaved it off and i thought i said you know it doesn't look bad and then you just get in the habit of it and you're just like this is my look this is how this is how i look now and you just get comfortable with yourself and you just say screw it i don't this is the way it is are you married yes i am i rest my case i rest my case <laughs> because women don't care that uh, took me a long time to figure out women don't care <laughs> i i was rejected two times because i didn't have hair but they were the wrong they were the wrong people for they, you. they were florida trailer trash so it's oh uh, now wait a minute now hold on <laughs> name calling doesn't help but you found somebody who who, who liked you all i mean every mm -hmm. every bit of you and, and the 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 lack of hair on top doesn't really matter that much it's it's us it's mm -hmm. men uh of the of the of the sexes the genders i think men are far more vain Mm -hmm. We are far more uh, uh, critical of ourselves and our shortcomings uh, than, than women are. Women have, this is a, a generality here, uh, McGovern getting into some BS philosophy. <laughs> I just think women think about other things. Mm -hmm. that, that's, uh, and and, and uh, that's good news for us. So we don't have to worry so much. And the ones who don't like us because we're bald, they miss it they're missing out it, it is what it is I mean, see what e see what egotism it takes to get through life yeah <laughs> it, it really does uh, but you can be egotistical egocentral and egocentric or whatever they call it and still be a good person still be mm -hmm. nice still be you know but when it comes to the things you want and what you're competing for uh you're more than up to the up to the task and that ego does make you stand out, it, regardless of profession, whether it's yours or yeah. or mine. Still having that having that little bit of edge that you're that your very self confidence maybe a little bit more so than you should be, but that's going to set you apart from the guy that's just 
a little bit slump shouldered. And you're exactly right. And what does that say? He's a problem solver. Mm -hmm. He could he could help solve my problem. And the problem might just be, how do I make this shot look uh, scary? Or how do I, you know, oh, I, I, I need actors for this. And I've assembled a cast of people who can do it and solve my problem. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing that I've always told actors. Remember, you're not the only one who's, who's got a problem at this moment. The problem of, of auditioning and, and getting the part. Mm -hmm. The guys on the other side of the camera also have problems too because they're looking for hopefully you. And you just have to convince them that you're the guy they've been looking for. And you do that with, I think, with, with the kind of energy you put out, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the kind of confidence that you have in yourself. Again, that's ego, and it's healthy and good. I agree. Um, my last question, because uh, we're running out of time. Um, since you're a seasoned veteran of the entertainment industry, what advice would you give to those people who are looking to make that move to L.A.? who want to follow that dream. Uh, Cause it's, it's harder now. It's much harder now because of the situation we're in than it was before, but what would you, what would be your advice to those people that want to make that big leap? Stay out of my way. <laughs> you know, something I, I, to give you a, a straight uh, answer to that. You, you post it in a way that makes it, very difficult for me to answer because you said things have changed so mind you i have been out of la i do i do work up here in san francisco but it's a whole different atmosphere mm -hmm. there's not that much of it it's it's not do or die um and i don't know how things you know it's, it's been 30 years and i don't know how things have changed in la but i do know they've changed why don't you give me a, a clue how have they changed uh, it's a lot more of uh, submitting submitting tapes uh, from yeah, what a lot yeah. of actors have told me. Sit, there's there's not that many more sit down in person uh, auditions anymore. So you're you're doing your best take on your phone or on your on your camera and sending it in, and you don't get that immediate feedback as you would from an audition. Yes, so, and that's okay. Excellent point. Uh, I I don't I have representation now, but I I tell you quite recently I've been sitting here watching the the fantastic work that's being done on tv i subscribe to everybody i my, mm -hmm. my my entertainment bill is very large in terms of netflix and and uh, 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 you know all the pay for view stuff mm -hmm. uh, hulu and all of that. i i have it all i watch everything yep. and there's so much great work being done and i'm not there i'm not there and it's a consolation to say well you're an old guy you're done now but i'm not you know, I, I studied with Stella Adler and she said, acting is the one thing you can do all your life. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you're okay, if you're physically okay, and you still have uh, your chops, uh, you can go on and do it and do it. So I could theoretically uh, find an agent, talk him into uh, putting me on his list, and then start sending in auditions. I just haven't made that decision that I want to do that. But I can see what you mean by it being much more difficult because you take out the the chat element. You can't mm -hmm. chat with anybody, and chatting is very important because an act a, a producer sees you uh, audition in front of him, and then he has questions that, that you can answer right then and there. Uh, but you can't when you send in that tape. Everything has to be contained in the tape. What else is different uh... in the age of the internet and and uh, streaming and all that stuff. What, what else has changed? I don't think much else has changed from the core basics of the industry as far as getting into it. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing that I've heard from my friends who are still actors in uh, Louisiana and in LA is it's just all about not, not getting the feedback right away or not, not creating those interpersonal connections that you would if you walked into a, a casting director's office. Mm -hmm. It's and that, and then they can't grow because they don't know until weeks later when they get the uh, rejection, if they even hear anything at all. Now, a lot yeah. of times it'll just go into the void and you, you won't know, you won't know what you, if you did something wrong or if they even got it. 
uh, it, well, it seems like it's become a lot less personal and that I think in the future will affect actors and their craft because they won't have the, they won't have the community that they need face to face. Well, I, I think you've, boy, you've articulated that very well. It's, Thank uh, you. I, I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm not doing this, but, but I, I'll get to a point uh, where I think I'm going to, I really think I'm going to get an agent and occasionally uh, do the audition. The thing is, then you have to fly down. That's mm -hmm. what I learned when I first started that first audition I did, I was in LA, I come home and it wasn't for a, a, a recall, another look. I had gotten the job, so that wasn't so bad. But if you don't live where it is, it becomes very difficult um, not to, for the follow through. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can see that, uh, yeah, things have significantly changed. Yeah. Well, if you want it, you'll get it. That's all I can say. And if you want to be a voice actor, don't forget, spend the day, a good portion of the day, doing your voices mm -hmm. out loud. I always say, if, if your friends start looking at you in a way like, what's wrong with him because he's over in a corner doing the voice of a duck or a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, a Gestapo agent, that's the thing that separates us. That's the thing that makes us successful is that we are constantly, constantly doing voices and we can slip in and out of them, you know, no problem do the voices, do the voices, and then they'll, you'll create a need for somebody to have you do a voice for them. Mm -hmm. uh, my one follow-up uh, to my last question, would it be advantageous for people that want to do voice acting to create their own content with the voices? It, well, practicing, practicing is great, but also create something so they have a little bit more investment to be able to do the voices on command without having to clear their throat or prep or anything. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question completely, but what I get from it is uh, create something of your own to yes. get noticed, right? Yes, yes. Well, you know, I, mm -hmm. uh, I uh, thought about that too. I think about things a lot that I, some that I don't do, but um, it's a good thought. And that is, if you if you do a, a, a bunch of voices and you're really hot to uh, to do something with it, then why not create your own story? Why not do a podcast type uh, continuing story of you and your characters? That means you then have to have to have the ability to write something, mm -hmm. or I'm sure many young actors in this day and age have friends who do other things like. Uh, can do animation um, and you team up with that guy and say, hey, look, why don't we do an animated piece? I'll do the voices, you do the animation, let's sit down and write a story. And you do that and you get it around, send it around to people and uh, it becomes quite a sales tool. So yeah, I think, that's, I think that is a great idea. Teaming up with somebody and the two of you uh, getting yourself seen and now it's a matter of sometimes not even getting an agent it's just a matter of doing something on youtube that gets a lot of hits i i, I tried out for a part of, I, in fact they wanted me i won't mention the company but they were up here and they were very very successful and they did walking dead so now i'm giving it away i i did a, a character on walking dead for them and uh, 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 the, the wolf among us is that yes. the name of it yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and i was a, a character on that as well and i really admired them i thought they were great and one day i was uh, in a bar odd place for me to be and uh this guy walked in and he said i'm from this company and we'd love you to be and they named the character it was for batman so I went home and knocked out a couple of uh, uh, auditions, sent it to them. And the, re the, the first response was, oh, my God, this is fantastic. This is perfect. This is just. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ah. And that right away, I went, mm, that's a little too much enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Don't 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 jinx me. Sure enough, they went to the head guy and he passed on me mm. after after they asked me, they came back and said, he really likes you. How many. Uh, 
uh, Twitter followers. Is that it? Twitter followers. Do you have? And I said, I don't have any. Oh, okay. Well, we'll tell them that. I think I had a couple hundred or something mm. like that. I was not pursuing it. I didn't get the job because my Twitter numbers weren't good enough. I, I know which company you're talking about and I know what happened to them. So I, Oh, I cursed them. I put them out of business with just <laughs> sheer, no, I'm, t- I'm, kidding. I'm totally joking. But, but I, I can see how those decisions would lead to worse decisions down the road. But I, I, I was appalled. I mm. couldn't believe it. And, and with maybe the actor they picked uh, with this huge Twitter following was, was, was qualified. Of course he, you know, we're all qualified to do the job, mm-hmm. but some better than others. And just as in that, that example I gave you of, of being able to chat yourself up in an audition adds to your castability. Mm-hmm. They figured this guy, particular guy, uh, thought, well, if he has a huge n- number of Twitter followers, that will also help promote. He'll be able to say to his, his fans, look what I'm doing. And I suppose there's some kind of truth to that. But I don't think people watch shows because of an actor has a big Twitter following. I could be wrong. But anyway, that's what happened to me. And I stayed in that bar and I never left. <laughs> and I made sure... <laughs> I just kept drinking and saying, <laughs> damn you, damn your life. I will. No, you have to forget it, baby. You have to just go forget it. Mm-hmm. Go, go shoot some hoops. Uh, don't have a drink. That's not one of the ways you forget it. Um, do something healthy and uh, something good for yourself. Uh, give yourself a little reward for having, having done the job of auditioning and doing your very best. Give yourself a little reward. I had a teacher who said, give yourself a cupcake. <laughs> that was his idea of a little reward or a little piece of cake, a little, a little something to nosh on mm-hmm. and say, I did a good job. I didn't get the job, but I did a good job. Mm-hmm. I, think, I, I think that's the perfect place to end it. I, I was very excited to have you on. It was, it was something I've been I've been looking forward to when I um, when I found the information I need to to be able to get this rolling. I was like, oh yes, I've I've got to do this. I just, I have well, to. <laughs> I, I'm thrilled and delighted to hear you say that, Michael. Michael Phelan, the name of a very the character in. I'm trying to remember this books that came out of Albany and a writer from Albany, but one of them was one of the books was called Michael Phelan. And it was about the, the city of Albany in the, in the Depression days. Great series of books. I'm sorry, I can't remember the titles. But uh, to you, I will say, what was your question? <laughs> uh, I didn't have one. I was, just, I was just expressing how nice it was to get to, get to talk oh. to you after, after being a fan of your work when I was a kid. And then now as a fellow professional, getting to talk to you and getting to, getting to know you on a more interpersonal level. Isn't that great? And you find out that people are just people we're are people. Just, we're just <laughs> schmucks walking around trying to do something, have, having a piece of cheese and making a phone call. And uh, I'm very delighted to have met you. And I'm glad that I'm I'm alive because uh, it was many many years, decades after doing this that uh, uh, Neary uh, called me, uh, my agent, and said, uh, "Hey, we thought you were dead." That was a great opener, right? I said, well, no, I'm very much alive. They said, well, would you like to do some comic cons? Had no idea what they were. Mm-hmm. And uh, that opened up a whole new career. I'm doing comic cons. I'm doing one right in our, our backyard at, uh, in Concord, uh, California in uh, uh, November 7th, I think. Uh, but it, it gave me a whole new career, a whole new perspective on things. I, and I get to meet people like you who are doing a wonderful job of, of promoting this craft. and uh, and you know promoting what you love so you're a very lucky guy but you did it through hard work uh, thank you very much for your and your words. wife and your wife made a very wise choice <laughs> i was surprised because she's she's an upstate new yorker so i didn't think that she would be into a uh, a uh, uh, southerner <laughs> upstate new yorker and southerner do you re- are you really you really consider yourself a southerner is that a state I of would, mind uh it's 
there is a culture that goes along with being from the south it's it has its positives and its negatives and its stereotypes but my parents were from um lancaster pennsylvania so they oh, yeah. when they yeah, moved when they moved to florida yeah they they had their they had their northern um uh, culture that they raised me in so i didn't i wasn't like a good old southern boy <laughs> you didn't you didn't grow up eating grits no no i i it was a lot they were uh german and irish so it was a lot of um it was a lot of hot dogs and sausages and kraut and <laughs> potatoes and stuff like potatoes. that. Potatoes. Potatoes. <laughs> all, all of us are all of the Irish that came over because they they lost their potatoes. Yep. Very, very bad thing, a horrible thing. That's how um, my that's how my family came over and then followed the gold rush. Some of them went to California following that gold yeah. rush. <laughs> Phelan's a great name. I love that name. Thank um, you. But uh, I mean, I sometimes a lot of times lately it, it troubles me how much how much difference there is between the the the, the Yankee and the rebel mm -hmm. that that crap is still alive yes there's and, there's an entire uh eco ecosphere and economy based on being southern it is yeah. a very it's it's a huge industry down here and in some ways it's endearing but in some ways it's kind of terrifying because the stereotypes are stereotypes for a reason and they and some of the bad stuff that goes along with it still exists like you don't know nothing <laughs> that, that's from deliverance <laughs> there there but, is but, there mean, is you know, some of that don't do, we don't do we don't do that uh, in the i mean i never experienced anybody saying to a southerner oh a confederate huh? i mean you know what I mean? It, it yeah. doesn't, the, the situation is, is in reverse. We could care less where you're from. Mm -hmm. if, if, if we're in the North, if we're in New York or somewhere above the Mason Dixon line, but it is a qualification and an observable difference that the Southerner makes when you show up in their midst. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 that, that baffles me. Yeah. And, and we're the only ones that use the word y'all. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, I still say y'all, I spent some time in Oklahoma when I was a little kid and I, I still have, and I like y'all, y'all's a great term. It's, it, it's very embracing. Yeah. You know, it means everybody mm -hmm. y'all. Uh, and I, I, I've spent time in the South. God, I was at Fort, uh, I was at McClellan, Fort McClellan in Alabama mm -hmm. in the uh, chemical warfare, uh, department down there you know that's what i was being trained for and uh was introduced to grits was introduced to what it's like to be a yankee in the south and i didn't i didn't particularly care for it and and i still think it's i think it's getting to the point where it's really starting to solidify mm -hmm. and calcify and hurt our democracy it's it's a it's a very very fearful thing i'm i'm very concerned for us i hope we can learn to get over this this divide between us and i hope we can all get our shots hello anybody out there i think most of the people that watch the show and and read the the sites that i work for are probably all all have their shots i know i know i do but my mainly my reason is if i if the pandemic comes to a a crawl and things go back to normal i'm going to be flying everywhere and i don't want to lose those opportunities can't i can't wait for that i can't wait for that i've had to tell neary i can't go to vegas i couldn't go to uh, uh lexington and i wanted to in the worst way mm -hmm. but you know I, i'm an old guy i'm 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 very uh, i'm a good candidate for covid mm -hmm. Uh, but thank God, I, uh, the, the things that I have that compromise me health wise, I take very, very good care of and I'm inoculated and I even went and got the booster. So, uh, and I believe it's helpful, but I never leave the house without a mask. Hmm. It's just, and, and here in uh, Northern California, we're in a very, uh, conscientious environment because mm -hmm. everybody, everybody out there there was wearing a mask with notable exceptions. Some idiots run around. The thing that drives me crazy is the mask 
and people wearing it and think they're doing a really good job, but they do this. Mm -hmm. And the nose sticks out there. Their hooter is sticking out over the mask. What do you think you're accomplishing there? Well, here in Florida, it's hardly anybody wears them. It's oh, just, no. it's, I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's just, Florida has always been very weird when it comes to everything. No one seems to really, when you get into Florida, everyone seems to not care. Like problems don't exist past the panhandle. Isn't and, that fantastic? That is, that's truly fantastic. That's that, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the way things are. Well, you have a, uh, you have a man in the, in the governor's mansion who, what can I say? Uh, problems start at the top, uh, being misled. Uh, there are people who mislead us or try to mislead us. And you have to be very, very careful about who you listen to mm -hmm. and whose advice you take. And I think, I think a lot of people want, want to hear things. And so when they hear them, they think, ah, see, I don't need the, the shot. So-and-so said, I don't need it. And that, that's not good enough for me. I, I have to make my own decision about my health. Mm -hmm. And I decided I don't want to get COVID. I have a son who's an RN and another boy who's a police officer. And they see this stuff firsthand. They have to go to homes and drag people out by ambulance and get them to a hospital where they're intubated. Why? Because you didn't wear a mask? Come on, please. Uh, I was, uh, I had to go to a VA uh, a few months ago and just the level of steps that it took, this is before uh, the shot was available for someone my age in Florida. So were, you, were get, you in the surf? Were you in the service? No, I was, I was doing some work for a VA. And so it was nurse had to come out, had to fill out all this paperwork, had to get swabbed and then had to come in and then like totally get sanitized just to walk in to just look at something to fix for them. And then I was looking at all, all of the veterans that had no visitors because either people didn't want to go through the hour long steps or they were just scared that they would kill their loved ones just by entering the building. It was heartbreaking just to it's see all of these it, lonely veterans. It's a national shame. Mm -hmm. Uh, my brother, uh, I'm a veteran. I, I don't uh, really uh, take uh, much advantage of, the, of my status as a veteran. But my brother, because uh, I, I never saw active duty. I was in the reserves. I hardly feel qualified. But my brother was uh, active duty. He was over in uh, uh, Korea for a, num a number of years. And uh, he developed uh, they think it could have been Agent Orange that gave him these uh, these conditions. And he goes to the Veterans Administration Hospital in Palo Alto, and he's treated like the most important guy in the world when he's there. The VA is wonderful when it's when it's working, mm -hmm. when, when when everything is working for it to to the veterans benefit. But there are places, pockets in this country where the veterans have no VA. You know, they just don't have that because they're, they're all in the big cities. Yep. And well, my, uh, my brother refuses to use any VA services. Why? Just, uh, because in when he was here in Florida, the VAs here are not that great. They either, uh -huh. they're, they're either understaffed or they don't have the level of service that you can get through a private provider. I so see. he would just say, I, I have health insurance through my job. I'm just going to pay my deductible and go. Because yeah. otherwise I'll be sitting at the VA forever. I'll see a doctor that's going to dismiss me. And what do I get for it? <laughs> well, from what I'm so sorry to hear that. And I know it to be true. But my brother uh, is so lucky because he lives near Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And Palo Alto is, is, is just chock-a-block with learning uh, uh, medical experts. We've got uh, uh, Stanford right there across the street. And so doctors from Stanford are coming to the VA and helping out. When you have it, when you have a situation like that, it's quite a different story. Your brother mm -hmm. probably would have been happy to go to the VA because you get you get your attention pretty quickly. 
very quickly and they do all sorts of things you don't have to pay for it mm -hmm. like um, my brother got a, a knee replacement because he was a veteran he yep. didn't, didn't have to pay anything for it but that's in a very specialized hospital with great uh advantages and and extras so i'm sorry to hear uh, about the folks in florida not being able to get good va coverage it's a yeah. shame yeah it, it is what it is but it's not as it's not as bad as i've seen in other places yeah. um up up the the mid-atlantic I've, I've seen some horrible vas uh but it that's something if if there could be anything that I would change about the, the government from top to bottom would be the structure of the VA for the people that are experiencing hardship. Just give those, give those men and women what they deserve, and that is care. I don't know why it's such a tough, tough job. You, I remember, I think all of our recent presidents uh, appointing somebody, a new person to head the VA because the last one uh, didn't do the job. Well. But then, so that guy gets replaced because he didn't do the job. Mm -hmm. Then, why is it so difficult to do the job? It must be a horrendous undertaking to take that on to head the VA. Mm -hmm. At the oh, most, you have know. maybe four years to do it before you're That's replaced. Right. At the most, eight years, which is not a lot to revamp an entire system that's serving millions of Americans. Well, you make a good point. It should be. It should be a permanent political appointment, mm -hmm. and you can't you can be uh, unseated, but it has to be not just because a new president has come in mm -hmm. and you're you're swept out. It should be you're there for any administration, and if you're doing a good job, you're allowed to stay that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you make an excellent point. You need more than eight years to straighten out <laughs> a, terrible, a terrible mess. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you're the guy. Ah, uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Uh, my side job could help a little bit. I mean, well, this this is what I consider a side job, though I really love what I do. But my nine to five is as a an engineer. So when I say that I go in to fix something with the VA, I'm fixing their security systems or I'm f fixing their nurse call systems or something like that. That's what pays the bills. But I yeah I, I wouldn't want that much stress and i wouldn't want to so, fail at it <laughs> so you, you're an it guy uh it in a way but more of a more of a hands-on engineer type of level like I see. how making sure that everything everything works not just do the computers work does does every input and output in something work kind of thing but look at that skill you have that to me that is awesome i would i just step aside when i need somebody to help me with my computer thank god i have a a friend who is a a wizard i he really is a wizard he has a phd in this stuff he used to write programs uh, for the classes at michigan state and he can fix things he can say terry don't do this do that and look it works <laughs> you got you could, i mean the world would stop if you guys suddenly took a break and went on strike so uh, I commend you, sir. Thank you. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that's that about wraps it up. I I, I talk too much. No, I sleep, no. I sleep. <laughs> I sleep too much and I talk too much. The the more time I have for people to open up, that's why I don't like doing a lot of talking on my show because it's not about me. It's about you all. It, it, I need you people to talk to open up to give that. Uh, that information or those experiences because they're not coming to see me. <laughs> Do I have to ask if did I talk enough? Oh, you talked enough. I got I've got I've got so much that people will be happy to to see their the man that they've heard and they've seen well they've seen that that they've seen that voice <laughs> coming out of of someone that's so ingrained in our childhoods for those of us that are in our our 30s and 40s. Well, all I can say to little buddy is I'm very happy to be here. And I think Mr. McDee's calling for me. I have had so much fun with you. I can't, uh, I can't tell you. Thank you, Michael. I'm sorry Thanks. I was late. No, it is, it is not a problem. It's, you didn't yell at me like Rob Zombie did that one time. I'm good. <laughs> Rob Zombie yelled at you? Well, hell, man. I think that, that's wonderful. You can say that Rob Zombie, it's like, 
years ago, I, I met Don Rickles. I did an interview with Don Rickles and he screamed at me and insulted me the whole time. It was, it was just, a, it was fantastic. That's, that's, a, that's something you, know, you should, that's a medal, a medal of honor. Rob Zombie yelled at me. Good for you. Hey, I'm not gonna yell, I'm, I'm just gonna say goodbye. God bless you, you're a, you're a nice man. And uh, I think we're both pretty gorgeous. <laughs> uh, and uh, take care of yourself. You've been listening to the Six Sense Media Podcast. You can find more of our celebrity, composer, musician, and filmmaker interviews, as well as pop culture roundtable discussions on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Pandora. Be sure to check out our vast library of entertainment industry coverage including on-set reporting from your favorite TV series and movies at SixthSense.com.